Okay? So the workload associated with creating that budget was significantly lower. The key thing about culture in the business is the way we've structured the IPP process. It's really driven decision taking down and devolved that into within the matrix organization, we do have a lot of focus on the product category teams. Okay? So we've got people in the organization lower down taking more decisions and therefore being more engaged with the business because they're getting more out of it. One of the other things we've managed to do is we have eliminated bias in our forecasting process, both from a volume and a value perspective. When we first started this journey, we had a phrase in, uh, in Dairy Crest. You may use the phrase back pocket. We had a lot of hedges. Yeah? And Dairy Crest had more hedges than Aintree Racecourse. Okay. And they were bigger. So on reflection, what are the key learnings and pitfalls that we've successfully navigated and avoided? Um, the first thing is we've put 80% of our focus here on the people and the behaviours. We've put maybe 15% of the effort here and only 5% on the IT tools and enabling the, the data to flow. We got top-down alignment from the very beginning. We had that compelling business need. So the project sponsor was the CEO himself. We invested all of our efforts in terms of training budget. We didn't have a massive training budget, but all of that training budget went into training and educating and re-educating the CEO, which is always quite a risky thing to try and do, as well as the, the man board members and the senior management. Because okay? if you didn't get everybody talking the same language at the top, then as that's delegated down, we'll have total confusion. We spent an awful lot of time on behaviours and really trying to get out of this back pocket mentality and really try to get people to talk about what they truly believed was going to be the most likely outcome. One of the key things we changed was to move to really embrace the principle of roughly right versus being precisely wrong. This is the context of we just spent millions of pounds on a demand forecasting tool that was going to tell us what our future demand will be for the next three years for every single SKU in weekly buckets to 10,000 delivery points. And it was also going to tell us how much we we're going to charge for those and how much profit we we're going to make. Okay. We had to reverse back from that and said, actually, that's crazy. One, we can't do it. Two, it's physically impossible. <coughs> and it's just absorbing far too much time and effort. So we chose instead to say, we're only, we're only really interested in detail up to a 13, 16 week horizon. Beyond that, we started to group products into products families that made sense for the sales teams. So they could forecast on units of products or customers that made sense to them. And then that would be translated by the demand planning team into the supply chain technology groups, okay, based on these products go on these production lines. One of the other decisions we took was um, on pricing and trying to project what were we going to charge for each and every product in the future. So we, 80% of our volume of Cathedral City is sold on deal and that's increasing. So our base volume of sales is very is very low now. So rather than trying to predict from the beginning of the year, what are we going to charge for that product? We simplified it to say, it's either a base price, it's a shallow deal, or it's a deep cut reduction. And we found that gave us a more accurate result than trying to do it by every single individual item. What it did for us is it meant the sales team brought into the process, they did a lot less data entry, they freed up the demand planning team to work a lot more collaboratively with demand 
So having those discussions and helping the sales guys on which metrics could be the most effective and also giving the heads up to the supply chain team to say, to be honest, on this estimate, it's high risk, we've not done this before, although we're saying it's 1,000, it could really be 500 or 2,000. And that then enables the supply chain team to focus on those individual events. Although we very much focus on roughly right versus precisely wrong within a demand planning environment, is we see that now throughout a lot of our culture and other functions as well. We stopped <coughs> focusing on mean average percentage error and weighted average percentage errors as the key measures of forecast accuracy. Yeah. Because ultimately, if I have four results and each error of those four forecasts are 20 each, the average, even by my maths, is 20. But I know my supply chain can cope with an error of plus or minus 20. I also know that plus or minus 20 on an, indiv on an individual SKU is not going to massively change the financial results of the business either. But if I have 5, 5, 5 and 65% error, I have the same MAPE score, but that 65 error, if it's an oversale, is going to drive me potentially into a service issue. If it's an undersale, we're going to have obsolescence. Okay? Now, we've reduced our obsolescence in two years by 97%. Okay? The reason why we focus on that is milk is a very thin margin business, if any at all, as is the whole dairy industry and products. So we said every time we have to sell products off because it doesn't have enough life on it or destroy it, that's straight bottom line loss. Okay? So the tools that we use is we actually look at the spread of the error. And on this side, we have how many SKUs were between plus or minus 10% for this category. This was cheese category. How many are within minus 30, minus 10? And we do the same then for the amount of volume. What volume <coughs> do those SKUs represent? So the focus then really is how do we drive the standard deviation down and remove these outliers which create all of the noise. Okay, they either create the service issue or the obsolete stock. We also said actually for a production category, because we can cut this data also by supply chain categories, we have different targets on what good and bad looks like. If I have a line with bags of excess capacity or I have multiple lines that can absorb that capacity, I don't need to be as accurate. Yeah. If I have a group of lines that are very uh, capacity utilised, then any significant errors in forecast are going to create not only the service issue, but I may be making the wrong thing, and I've used that capacity making something I don't need, and then I haven't got the capacity available to supply the oversell when it comes in. Keeping it simple. Really focus on the behaviours rather than the detail. So is a good meeting one that generates a thousand charts? Yeah, for us, it's not. It was that way when we started. What was important was that we structured every meeting by these four sections. Did we do what we said we were going to do? So looking back, have we delivered the performance? Is our forward plan realistic? I guess we've all seen charts that say, this is our current performance, but guess what, April Fool's Day, the first day of our new budget year, oh, performance is up there. Yep. Well, we know fully well that best case is, we may be able to gradually turn the corner and improve. Yep. So using the charts instead of numbers enabled us to check that we are realistic. Is the forward projection of performance good enough? Are we delivering to the business the top-down expectations? If we're not, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. What we found is month on month, cycle on cycle, the packs became smaller in content rather than larger and much more focused on this fourth po point rather than on the first one. Within DairyCrest, we have three distinct groups of finance. 